Okay, uh, let's start. Um, so the topic today is uh, memory, and uh, it's in many, many ways closely related to what we're going to talk about on Thursday, which is <coughs> learning. Um, but the way that I'm going to try and do it uh, today is to focus more or less on a lot of, uh, should we say, a little bit semantic, what is memory, what is learning, and then on Thursday to uh, go a little bit, bit deeper down and uh, discuss also what are the molecular mechanisms which explains uh, memory and learning. So this will mainly be sort of on the surface, uh, more psychological approach, whereas we will be doing a little bit more of a cellular molecular approach on Thursday. Uh, so first of all, different types of learning and memory. This is also in the book. Uh, the main separation that we can make, uh, which has some sense to it, uh, especially if we look at which parts of the brain are involved in these different types of uh, memory. Uh, we, we have on one side the explicit declarative memory, which is basically, as it says here, facts, events. It is me remembering what I had for dinner yesterday. It's me remembering more or less how I managed to get here in the morning. Uh, so I can also remember what is the capital of the United States of America, etc. can hopefully well, I didn't get married, so I can't remember getting married. But anyway, um, that's all things that we can uh, verbalize, that we can explain to each other through language, uh, and where we have an explicit memory of this is what happened in this particular place. What is important there is that we know that it is areas uh, around the temporal lobe in the lower part of uh, the basic part of the temporal lobes, also extending into the diencephalon uh, that are involved in this uh, process of creating explicit declarative memory. This is closely related also to working memory, which is mainly in the prefrontal lobe, and we're going to get back to that. Now, in contrast to that, we have the implicit or the non-declarative memory, and as you can see, this can be div divided into several different uh, types of memory. There's, first of all, motor learning, the, the learning of different motor abilities, skills, the habits that we have. Uh, here it only says striatum, but in fact, as I will come back to, it's all over the motor system that we see uh, changes in the processing in relation to motor learning and motor memory. So it's not only the striatum as it is set here, and which is also partly set in the book, not as strictly. We have all the classical conditioning, uh, which we're going to go back to a little bit. The most classical of these is uh, Pavlov's stalks. Basically that if you associate two different stimuli, in this case, something to eat and the clock ringing, then eventually you can have the dog salivating whenever the clock is ringing without having to associate it necessarily any longer with the food. Uh, if you do that for a long time, it will become disassociated again because the dog or its brain realizes that the clock doesn't mean food anymore. So this is typical examples. There's another example, which is the eye blink conditioning in rabbit. We can also do it actually in humans. If you just blow a little bit of air into the eye of an a, a rabbit, it will blink. Uh, if you ring a clock at the same time, then eventually you can just ring the clock and the rabbit will be blinking, even though it's not getting any air uh, into its eye. We have lots of uh, emotional responses, uh, so quite a lot of that is classical conditioning. Uh, it's still being debated to which extent we have an inherited uh, fear of uh, animals like snakes or spiders. Uh, to a large extent, most people, I think, would believe now that it is uh, learned 
responses, that it's classical conditioning taking place, uh, especially young infants seeing their mother, father, whatever, reacting with a fear response to one of these animals and therefore themselves also learning to sort of copy this response. Uh, all of these cases, the most important uh, difference in relation to the explicit declarative memory is that it's quite hard to explain exactly what is going on. We become better at doing something or we create whatever kind of response habit but explaining precisely what it is is really difficult. So it's a, a non-verbal part of the brain which is being changed in this case. Uh, so for instance, as an example, if you can ride on a bicycle, it's much easier just to show it to someone rather than to explain how it is being done. Uh, it's really difficult to sort of cognitively verbalize exactly what you have to do in order to be able to ride a bicycle. Whereas geography, you can explain quite clearly that this is the United States of America, it's situated just below Canada, right above Mexico, etc. All of that can be verbalized, but all of these things over here is something that we sort of know about. Our brain becomes better at doing it, but it's part of the brain which is sort of unconscious and which we cannot verbalize. This is another uh, way of just putting uh, the very same things. We have again declarative memory, events, facts. Uh, we have uh, non-declarative memory, implicit memory, procedural memory, perceptual representation systems, classical conditioning, non-associative learning, etc., which has different areas which are being involved. I actually like this sketch much better than what is in your book. Uh, so therefore I've put it here so that uh, you can use it. Uh, it's also uh, putting in long-term memory, short-term memory, uh, which is also important. To what an extent we have short-term memory in relation to the non-declarative memory. Based on this, this seems not to be the case. I'm not fully certain whether it's not really actually uh, the case because we definitely have evidence that in motor learning there are changes which takes place within a uh, short time after uh, training which disappear again uh, and is not necessarily remembered as such, which could signify that there is some kind of short-term memory also in relation to uh, some of these types of uh, training. But in general, uh, short-term memory is very often uh, said to be the same as the working, working memory, as in, in this case, in which case it's really uh, the sort of conscious awareness that we are here in this very moment and we can remember how we got into this room and what just happened a moment ago so that we have sort of a timeline we can remember uh, that what we just did a moment ago so that we have some kind of continuation in uh, our experience of uh, what is going on. This is what is normally said to be working memory and it relates very closely to short-term term memory, our ability to keep some information in our uh, uh, immediate uh, uh, experience memory um, 